Hi everybody, thanks for asking me, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to try and put landscape level conservation in a conceptual framework. So we've got some theory coming up. It's pretty general, easy stuff, but uh, I want to try and put it in context. From the very small scale, little local nature reserve, hectare, two hectare, right the way through to rewilding, and what actually we're trying to do. So, in 2010, I, I chaired a, a, a report, a, chaired a panel that produced a report which was called Making Space for Nature. And I think most of you will be uh, familiar with that. Uh, and amongst its 24 recommendations was that we should have a national competition in England uh, to establish what became known as nature improvement areas. And if you're not quite sure uh, what they are, there's a poster out there which, with, with 10 of the 12 nature improvement areas that eventually were established, summarising what they have achieved. The important thing is that the nature improvement areas were consortia of the willing. They were groups of voluntary conservation organisations, statutory authorities, local businesses, farmers, landowners, environment agency, the National Trust and so on. Different combinations in different places that came together and said, we want a nature improvement area. We want to improve the landscape in which we work and operate. And nobody imposed it on anybody. They were consortia of the willing and I think there may be an interesting lesson there for what we're talking about when we're trying to do other even bigger landscape level conservation projects because the guiding mantra of making space for nature is this more bigger better and joined uh, more designated sites uh, an increase in the size of current sites making them bigger uh, better management uh, improving the quality of current sites and joining them up through corridors and stepping stones and that is the underlying mantra of uh, making space for nature, and it is the underlying mantra for landscape level conservation, and the science underpinning it is absolutely unequivocal. There's no rocket science in there. We've known that for an awfully long time. It's a question of turning more, bigger, and better joined into practice. These are the 12 nature improvement areas. I don't have time to go through them in any great detail. In particular, I'm going to just show you very quickly uh, the Humberhead Level Nature Improvement Area here. Um, you see they vary in size, but they're typically about 50,000 hectares in size, uh, or about 500 square kilometres. But of course, not all the land within them is being uh, used for nature conservation. They are very much land sharing with, other, uh, with urban and agriculture and forestry environments. You can see them on there. They're very varied. Uh, there's an entirely urban one, based on Birmingham and the Black Country, uh, right the way through to uh, the Humberhead Levels, uh, 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 on the Marlborough Downs, one entirely run by farmers, uh, the Greater Thames Estuary, and so on. Uh, and let's just have a look at one. This is the Humberhead Level NIA, uh, partly on my patch in Yorkshire, partly across into Lincolnshire. Um, it's one of England's least well-kept secrets is that for several years we've had breeding cranes in that area. Uh, the RSPB didn't release them, they got there on their own. Um, <laughs> they will eventually. <laughs> Um, and, but the, everything on the map you can see there that, that's coloured is land that's being modified or changed and water bodies in some way. It's still in very big areas of intense agricultural land, uh, but the core of the Humberhead Levels NIA, and they all have different cores, uh, is, the, uh, is the, 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 the bottom right hand picture there where the area was being mined, literally mined for peat for the agricultural industry. Eventually that was stopped, but this area is just like a bloody moonscape uh, of eroding peat. And the core of the area is to put back uh, the functioning fen bog and, and, and peatlands in the core of the NIAs, but then lots of other more bigger and better joined things. And interestingly, the farmers in the NIA are competing to put ponds on their land because they want to see the cranes bring their chicks to feed on their land. Isn't that great? charismatic species that makes a difference. The model size, as I say, is about 500 square kilometres, uh, but only about 5% of the land within each NIA is actually being uh, re re restored and returned to nature. 
There are, of course, it's more than 5% of the entire NIA nature conservation activities because they all have valuable habitats within them anyway. But interestingly enough, I can't tell you what that percentage is. Um, and the total area of completely new habitat created in the NIAs is only going to be about 25 square kilometres. It's not, it's not huge. But that's the, the, the new habitat created. But it will make the sites more, bigger, better and joined. Of course, whether that will be sufficient uh, to reverse the decline in wildlife within the money time will tell and it is as I said classical land sharing because they all have many other things going on in them. Now that's at one end of, of, the, of the spectrum. Making Space for Nature also thought about rewilding the, the, the idea of what well, we defined it as areas where nature is simply left to get on with itself without human intervention. So what we're trying to do with rewilding on a much bigger scale than the NIAs is to restore natural ecosystem processes over as big an area as possible. And extreme cases in very large areas, the interesting question is, how big an area do you have to rewild uh, to be able to restore large predators, like wolves, for example, that are in the UK or places in Europe where they don't occur? How big an area do you really need uh, to, to, to get those kind of top predators, charismatic creatures, back into the landscape. Um, and uh, it wouldn't be, it isn't the only measure of success, but it's the other end of the spectrum th to really grab your imagination and think about it. Well, uh, because I had to think about that uh, last, last year, um, because on the, in, in, in April to, to, uh, 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine went bang big time put a huge plume of radioactivity across uh, part of Ukraine, Belarus, and right across Europe. Um, and uh, the, the area had to be evacuated, uh, and the RSBB, Be uh, BirdLife Belarus, uh, and uh, the Belarus government asked me to go and talk to the Belarus government about the idea of t turning the area in Belarus round the Chernobyl exclusion zone into a major wilderness area. And um, it's the biggest, admittedly accidental, rewilding project in Europe. This is the, uh, the, 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 the site. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Belarus. Here, big country. This is the, uh, uh, the, the, the exclusion zone. The Chernobyl reactor in Ukraine is here. This is the border with Ukraine. And this is the, uh, uh, the, the, the exclusion zone in Belarus. And the right-hand map there is the actual map of the exclusion zone. Now, that exclusion zone is just over 2,000 square kilometres. To a, to, to a few square kilometres, that's exactly the same size as the Lake District. So it's a big area. And 92 villages were completely abandoned within that area and 22,000 people, everybody who lived there, was taken out. And since then, the land has been abandoned. So it is the biggest rewilding project, though, albeit accidental, in Europe. It is terribly, terribly poignant. When you go into the exclusion zone, these are just some pictures of, uh, of the sites. There are abandoned villages, abandoned homesteads. If you peer in through the windows, there are children's dolls and furniture and people's nice forks and spoons. It's, it's terribly poignant uh, because they just had to get the hell out of it and they had to leave a lot of stuff. Uh, but uh, the rest of the area is, 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 is just going back to huge areas of, of wet fen, woodland, scrubland, and over the whole of this vast area. But it's not, even Palesi, uh, the Palesi exclusion zone, is not pure rewilding. There is fire suppression within it, uh, partly for, uh, and there's also tree planting. That's partly to stop the redistribution of radionuclides uh, in dust and, and in fire and so on. Uh, a key drain to the north has been blocked, uh, has, has, been, has been taken out to let the water flow through the reserve where it probably it had been blocked to stop farmland to the north from flooding. The abandoned buildings become breeding sites for uh, large mammals like, like bears. Uh, so, again, it's not, it's not natural in, if, in that sense. The European bison was reintroduced. There were, I think, 16 originally introduced. There are now something like 70 or 80. And for some reason that baffles me, they feed the bloody things. 
No idea why, but they do. Um, there are introduced raccoon dogs, uh, which are impossible from Southeast Asia, that are impossible to control. Timber, a bit of timber harvesting, and of course the effect of radiation on the flora and fauna uh, is disputed and actually very uncertain. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's heaving with wildlife. Absolutely heaving with wildlife. There are something like a thousand moose. Uh, there are six, 70 to 80 European bison, as I've said. The wolf population is about 150. We didn't see, incidentally, the, the, the bison and the moose picture there are not my pictures because the technium winter, as you can tell, and we were there in the summer. The moose footprints, are the, the, the wolf footprints are my pictures, which is near as we got to seeing a wolf. We saw their footprints. There are something like 150 wolves. That's probably close to carrying capacity because the wolves have effectively exterminated roe deer, uh, which they find easy to kill, and they're now having to concentrate on the, on the moose and red deer, which are more difficult for them to kill, and they're probably close to carrying capacity. There are about 30 lynx in the entire area. Uh, again, probably in competition with, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the wolves. Uh, uh, there are brown bears now, population of 16 and increasing. There are something like 15 to 10 to 15 pairs of white-tailed eagles, adult white-tailed eagles, and over 100 pairs of lesser spotted eagles. It's a hell of an area. Lots of other stuff. Uh, so if we treat Palessi as a parable, that's a short story designed to make you think. This is not rigorous macroecology that I'm about to do. This is a parable. Um, the, the, if we compare Palessi what's th with what's there uh, uh, and, and think about the really wild end of big-scale landscape conservation uh, and tell us what it tells us about smaller pieces of habitat that we're trying to rewild in Europe, what does it tell us about the ability to re-establish big predators in the landscape? Well, let's start in the Okavango Delta because that's a wonderful place. Uh, the Okavango Delta, which is, of course, tropical, subtropical. Uh, it's 18,000 square kilometers, one of the last great wildernesses in Africa. Uh, England's largest county, God's own country, my county, uh, is Yorkshire, which is 14,000 square kilometers. Belgium, that's a useful newspaper, big as Belgium, you know, newspapers say that. It's, it, Okavango is about half the size of Belgium. Um, and uh, it's heaving with big predators, the full set, uh, lion, wild dog, uh, cheetah, leopard, uh, hyena, and so on. It's, it's a magic place. Uh, the Yellowstone National Park, to which I have never been, on the other hand, which is probably a better comparison, um, has, is, is 9,000 square kilometres. Um, it has 300 grizzly bears and quite a, lot of black, quite a lot of black bears. It has about 120 wolves, close to those in Palessi. Lynx it has none, because again, probably there's competition between lynx and wolves, but it has mountain lions instead. Um, and uh, it's a, a sort of interesting comparison. Uh, and it, 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 it's a similar climate to Palessi uh, in that it's uh, cold continental winters, hot summers and so on. Uh, and it's the oldest national park in the world. What do, they, what do those two tell us? Well, and let's also look at Ennerdale. Now, those are big. Now, the biggest rewilding project in Britain is Ennerdale, wild Ennerdale. It's 47 square kilometres. Now, it's big and it's good. Um, but, uh, it, it, but it is the largest re rewilding project in Britain and the largest rewilding project in, Euro in, in Europe outside the accidental one of Palessi is the Oost-Vandersplas in the Netherlands which is 60 square kilometres uh, in the what was the Flevoland polder um, and uh, there are, there are uh, conic ponies, there are uh, cattle uh, but there are no large predators there and the people looking after Palessi shoot uh, large numbers of those big herbivores and the, the rest are left to starve to death. That great contention with the public. So size matters for the return of the wild. So if you do some simple sums, and this is, I say, this is a parable, it's not rigorous macroecology, but actually even if you did lots of sums and burnt a lot of computer time, you'd get roughly the same answer anyway. Uh, so Us van der Plaats is 60 square kilometres, and that, within its fences, if it's a seal reserve, which it is, it could have one to four wolves between naught and one lynx and half a brown bear. Uh, the English Lake District, uh, Wild Ennerdale, is 20% smaller than uh, the Nuus van der Plaats. Uh, so um, it, that's going to be pretty gentle rewilding. Welcome in, in Wenderdale, but pretty gentle rewilding. You're never going to put 
wolves there. But lynx, now lynx are interesting because actually lynx can tolerate people. Lynx could, you could have lynx in Ennerdale providing they were also present in the wider Lake District landscape where there's loads of raw deer uh, and they wouldn't half solve the deer problem uh, and make life quite exciting, um, especially if you're a sheep. <laughs> But, but, you know, you begin to get the sense of the, of the challenge. So let's put, those, let's put all that lot in a picture. Now, this is, the, this is the conceptual picture. Along the bottom here, you've got the size of the protected area uh, in, uh, in square kilometres from a hectare, 0.01 square kilometre, all the way through to uh, 10 to the 5 uh, square kilometres. Uh, so Ockervango, Yellowstone, Pelesi, Us van der Plas are in here. And at this end, you've got the more traditional um, nature reserves that we have. You've got uh, the range of typical UK nature reserves. The Yorkshire Wildlife Trust's smallest reserve is a, is, is, is a hectare, right up in this top corner. Most of the other sites we have, the nature improvement areas, wildlife trusts, RSBB reserves, national nature reserves, lie in this band here. So this end, basically, the very small end is gardening, that's what you're doing at this end. And at that end, you're not doing anything very much at all. Um, and the intensity of management, the intensity of human intervention, actually per hectare, increases the smaller the area. There's lots of evidence to show that. Uh, and the bigger the area, the less human intervention you need, but there's always going to be some. The fascinating thing is that the total area of Natura 2000 sites is, is nearly is 787, 67 square kilometers. So the total area of Natura 2000 sites across Europe comes come here. It's huge, but of course it's fragmented. They're all of the, they're, the, many of them are small. If you look at the map of the Natura 2000 sites, uh, the, 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 there's a huge number of them. Many of them are small, and many of them are isolated. So here's a challenge at a European scale. How many Natura 2000 sites could we join up with proper corridors? From the bottom up, because people want to join them up. They don't impose it, you ask people to do it. Wouldn't that be a fantastic thing to do? How many could you do? I don't know, but it's, think about it. I'd love, to give, I'd love to give it a try. So more, bigger, better and joined is about moving conservation from the top left here in, down that arrow. That's what, we're, that's what we're about. And at all points along that trajectory, it's all worth doing. Pure rewilding, the absolute wilderness stuff, is at this end, but that needs to be huge. Uh, but the whole point of what we're trying to do with conservation level is move down in that direction. And the, the, how far we go and how big we do is a measure of success in conservation practice. But more, bigger, better and join just applied to uh, protected areas on their own is not going to be enough. We know that. So our ability to bring back the wild is powerfully influenced by additional factors of which you're all, all aware. I just wanted to remind you. First of all, how tight or how permeable are the boundaries of the protected areas? Uh, second, the nature of the landscape around the protected area and the attitude of the human beings who live in those landscapes. And bringing back the wild is not only about more, bigger, better and joined reserves, but it's also about getting the hearts and minds of the people who live in and around the reserves to tolerate nature. And the sort of thing uh, that, that Teresa was talking about in the landscape she was dealing with is absolutely about hearts and minds rather than uh, about management. And we know we can do it, actually. I mean, wolves are actually remarkably tolerant of people. The wonderful studies that have been done by Chapron and his colleagues at the Swedish Agriculture University. Wolves can coexist with people when people live at a density of 3,000 per square kilometre, providing people leave them alone. Most of the white-tailed eagles we have in, in Scotland are outside nature reserves. Some of the nests are protected, but the rest of them live in a landscape that they share with people. And they're there because if you live on Mull, they're worth an awful lot of money for you in terms of tourism. Wouldn't it be great to have lynx all over the Lake District? Uh, brackets, fewer sheep, close brackets. <laughs> Only 13% of the Natura 2000 sites are truly wild. The rest of it all have people living in, round and on them. So we already do it to a degree. 
So the future of landscape conservation, um, if we're going to be really ambitious, is not just, or even in some cases even, uh, with a step change in more, bigger, better and joined nature reserves, but in winning hearts and minds that allow people and wildlife to live together at a bigger scale than we currently do. It'll require an awful lot of collaboration, a lot of it is already going on, uh, we, we, it, we, and it, we just need to do more of it. We know what we have to do, and all I would say is let's have more, bigger, better enjoying wildlife inside and outside our protected areas. We know how to do it, let's just get on with it. And by the way, Pelesi, we failed. Uh, the, the Belarus government, well, this is a little PS, wasn't interested in creating a major reserve and research station. Uh, BirdLife Belarus and RSPB decided that it just wasn't possible and they've withdrawn their efforts, so the trip failed. Thank you.